I think privacy coins are going to be it. You know that Monero and Verge and other all uh, and other privacy coins, um, Zcash, uh, that they are going to be the ones that people go to because it's it's not just going to be about what what can I use in the absence of Swift. It's going to be what can I use without my government stealing my money. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. Cake Wallet is trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you, and supporting us is easier than ever by typing in Monero Talk Talk Crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tooman interviews Frank Dashwood, a super early Bitcoin OG with years of crypto wisdom and experience. Frank goes into detail on how he believes that the cryptocurrency in general is going to be the biggest industry over the next decade, how the inability to stop people from writing their own code keeps the market open and free, and how important and unstoppable cryptocurrency is. Frank is a proponent of Monero and most impressed by how it has continued to grow in adoption for its digital cash use case. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Frank, what's going on, man? Oh, not a whole hell of a lot. Just getting ready to go to jujitsu and uh, get my get my roll on. That's cool, pretty much man. it. Just been, uh, yeah. I, I, I so what don't about know. you? What about Monero? <laughs> Sorry. I don't ahead. know much about you, but I've seen you on Twitter for like a long time. Like, I always see that, 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 that picture of you popping up. I'm like, you're, you've become a familiar face on Twitter. Um, and then I like clicked on some links and checked out your, pro- like, it looks like you've been around crypto for, for a long time. And um, I think you've made some Monero comments along the way. And I think you might have been ver- into Verge at some point. I was checking out some of your old videos. So I was like, I got, I got to talk to this guy. He looks like he, uh, he might know a thing or two. So that's why I asked you to come on. Well, I appreciate the recognition there. Um, yeah, I, I've been involved in crypto since the very, very beginning, like, I almost I almost wore my slash dot shirt just to represent, you know, and show you out, show you all how old school I am. Um, but that was my first exposure to uh, to cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin was when Satoshi Nakamoto posted his his uh, white paper for the first time. It was uh, mentioned on slash dot. And a few of my friends from my Linux users group were like, hey, you know what? You talk about money all the time. You, you probably dig on this. And so I read the white paper and I was just like, ah, <laughs> you know, it, it was pretty much everything that, that I thought that money could be, you know, as far as uh, where we could be going with the internet and um, what kind of, what kind of new money there could be, you know, not, I mean, it's not like digital money that was stateless was entirely an alien concept when Bitcoin came along, you know? And so when you looked at it off right off the bat, were you like, this, this is, this is going to work or did you have your doubts? Oh, well, you know, I, I've, I had a lot of doubts and anybody who, who was involved in it back then, um, if you weren't thinking that there was maybe going to be a federal agency or somebody knocking on your door at some point or another, uh, you're just fooling yourself. You know, you're just being naive. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that all of the attempts to have a stateless digital currency before then had been quashed due to a variety of reasons. Um, typically, it was because there was only one or a very few people involved at the very top. And so it's just a matter of taking out that centralized entity 
and and you know you take them out with a lawsuit you put them in prison you know whatever the case may be but then the effort goes away and uh, bitcoin was kind of different in that um up until that point i don't think there had been an attempt to um enlist just random strangers and doing it completely permissionlessly and i i think that was its biggest advantage is that you know we could get away with it you know, the first year or two, because it was just a hobbyist project. You know, it didn't really have a market. Um, it didn't really have exchanges. It didn't have an official exchange rate. And it didn't have an entity that was governing it. And that's what it allowed it to initially kind of take root, is what you're saying, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, because it, it didn't, it wasn't dependent upon a physical location. You know, you could be in South America, you could be in China, you could be in Singapore, Hong Kong, you'd be anywhere and and running the Bitcoin software and acting as a miner on the network. And that I, I think that's really what what gave it its biggest advantage is that, again, you couldn't just go to somebody's house and say, hey, you stop doing that or we're going to put you in prison and and the project, you know. But I, I think that. uh <laughs> We've come a long way since then. And uh, I think that most of this stuff, to, to tell you the truth, is has not really been tested. I mean, it's been tested in the sense that, you know, you've had hackers and you've had scammers and, and so on and so forth. But I mean, like, like what we're facing in Ukraine, where, you know, people are being put into a position where crypto is the only money that they could be using. You know, I mean, we've had little little instances here and there where, where that's been the case and it's and it's functioned well, you know, like with with the case with Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, like if you if you look back to like 2013, 2014, you had people in Zimbabwe using Bitcoin because their, their currency was going through through major issues of, of uh, solvency and whatnot. And uh, and so they were being they were being forced to utilize Bitcoin as a medium of exchange or a way to a way to spend money. And uh, we've also seen that in, in like Venezuela, uh, the first attempt at a CBDC, the Petro, that was initiated because the Venezuelan people had pretty much adopted crypto. And, and like I, I keep saying it to my friends and family and whatnot, but if you really want an idea of, of how cryptocurrency will eventually be treated by all governments on this planet, all you have to look do is look at Venezuela. They, they tried banning Bitcoin. They tried stopping miners. You know, they, they would figure out where a miner is. They'd send the cops to the miner's house. The cops would take all the gear and then they would take it home and set it up at their house. And so it's like when, when you've got those kind of forces going on, you're not going to stop it. You know, and when Bitcoin became too expensive to use as money, people started using Dash. People started using Verge. In Monero, Litecoin, you know, and so it's it's one of those things where you're just not going to get ahead of it. And I, I think that that some banks and uh, and governments are starting to get realistic about that fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let, let's go back to your, kind of your your genesis a little bit too. So how how did you even how were you sure even thing. on that list? Like how did you even come across this? You said on Slash Dot, like what? What were you doing at the time that even kind of like led you to this? You were already interested in these concepts or? Well, I've always been op in interested in open source software. Um, you know, the I, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a time when Linux was, again, just a hobbyist project that a bunch of bunch of neckbeards were into, you know. Um, but when my friend told me about it, I was having a specific problem where I didn't have a hundred bucks to pay for a copy of windows and I needed a new computer. And so, you know, I had my friends help me build a computer. I installed Linux on it and, uh, you know, went on from there. Yeah. My, uh, my college up until that point, I'd been a my college roommate was one of the, those Linux Go kids. Ahead. And at the time, uh, you know, I didn't really understand it. I didn't even really get it. I didn't even really understand like the, the what it even really meant to, to be open source and everything that comes along with that. 
Uh, I've since, you know, grown in my understanding with my involvement in crypto and in Monero in particular. So what um, when, when, when you were like looking at Bitcoin in the early days, did you were there things that you kind of predicted then that have since happened or are there things that have happened now that have completely shocked you with regard to where we were at back then? The, the biggest shock for me was um, was Mt. Gox. Um, but no, there, there's there's a number of things that I predicted for cryptocurrencies um, that have yet to happen. Um, but a few that I named uh, that that have happened. And uh, one, of, one of them in particular was altcoins. Um, there, there was a period when Bitcoin was it, you know, the, it was the only coin. And then uh, I, I noticed that there was there was a little bit of a, a drift in the uh, in the tenor of the conversation of who should be involved in mining it, who should be involved in in managing the the uh, the uh, source code for for Bitcoin, who who should be managing the functions of Bitcoin. And when I started noticing that there was a lot more that thou shalt than we will. Um, I, I started thinking to myself, you know, it, it was a, a big conceptual leap to go from a world where there was currencies that were only issued by governments and, and, and central banks, rather, <laughs> and a world where the average person could take open source software and participate in a financial network, a currency that was global in scope and peer to peer in nature. You know, um, that that in itself was a big enough leap. But once you've made that leap, that's just the first leap. The next leap is if this is open source and it is functional, I can copy it and redistribute a version of my own. And, and that, that was my my understanding of it. And, and again, I was coming to it from Linux, you know, where. My, my Linux users group guys kind of oriented me with Linux and the fact that there were multiple variants of it. And, and, and that in itself was a, a tough sell, you know? So, you know, you're going from proprietary operating systems only to open source operating systems. And now there are different open source operating systems that are based upon the original. And so when you take that mentality and you extend it out, out to other open source projects, Bitcoin being one of them, it, it's not that big a leap to say, well, there's going to be other versions of this. Because at some point or another, somebody's going to say, this coin doesn't have enough functionality for me. The, the way this coin works doesn't work for my use case. So I'm going to modify it so that it does work for my use case. And maybe somebody else wants to download it and maybe somebody else wants to participate in my network. And so now we have altcoins. And when I suggested that a lot of people laughed, <laughs> but uh, here we are, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Talking on so... the narrow talk, which is basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very, very cool, man, that you're, that you're so old school um, and that, you know, it's, so it, it seems like you're, you're not you're not a BTC max. Would you consider yourself a BTC max? It doesn't seem like that, right? Obviously, you you were into Verge at some point. You're 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 you're. I think you're. Into I'm Monero. still into Verge. You're still into Verge. Okay, yeah. So you, so you're definitely not a BTC yeah. max. Um, what what did that shock you? The kind of the the uh, growth of B, BTC maximalism is that something that that caught you off guard? in the evolution of, of crypto? I knew that there would be resistance from within and the, it's just the nature of competition. Um, however, I didn't understand that we would have things like Jack Dorsey, who is uh, who runs a, a third party payment service pro provider. Uh, I think it's Stripe or Stripe or whatever the fuck the name is. Um, my apologies on that. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what the, I, I think it's Stripe. It's Stripe, right? Jack Dorsey's thing. Yep. Stripe. Okay. Yep. 
Well, what what I didn't envision was that we would have somebody um, doing something like like deleting people's tweets or or curating their exposure um, to to limit it, you know, to to limit people's exposure to it. And I didn't envision that that being something that would happen. Um, BTC maximalism, I, I think, is is just bullshit. Most of the most of the people that spout that kind of stuff don't even own coins. They don't run a node. They aren't miners. They're just people talking on Twitter, and some of them paid to be talking on Twitter and saying the things that they are. Mm. I mean that, that kind of that kind of resistance is is envisionable. I mean you can you can kind of speculate it about it being it coming about, but until you actually see how it expresses, um, no, I did not I did not envision BTC maximalism um, being what it is <laughs> or has been. And with the advent of altcoins, what was your, you know, obviously you, so you kind of predicted that, um, what was your prediction as to where that was going to go? Did you see a world where there'd be, you know, like, like we're seeing now where there's thousands of these things and, or did you just think there'd be one or two? No. Or do you think that, <laughs> go? like, what, what's your, your current take on, on altcoins and what's your outlook there? Well, you know, originally I thought that it'd be something like Linux where you had like, you know, five or six major branches and maybe, maybe uh, 20, 30 um, top, top versions that people use. And, and to some extent that's, that's been how it play, it's played out. But the, the, the things like NFTs, ICOs, um, those, those were kind of surprising. Um I, I don't know. I think ICOs are kind of a, a natural idea off of off of forks. It's like you know why why just fork it? Let's monetize the fork. <laughs> um, but the 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 way things spanned out that that way, I think, was kind of a surprise to me. Um, the number and, and type of altcoins surprised me. You know, I'll give you one that that, that always gets people: Mugatu coin. Mugatu coin. That's how crazy it got on on Twitter. Like in, in Twitter on in 2014 2015 was probably the most insane thing I, I'd ever seen. You know where we we had exchanges popping up every other day. We had coins popping up every other day. Um, if you didn't have a white paper or you didn't have a product, nobody took you seriously. I mean now it's kind of a, a big contrast where we've we've spanned into things like ICOs where people are throwing money at it, just completely sight unseen. And, and same thing with NFTs and NFT markets. And it just gives you an idea of how desperate the market is really. Um, but as far as the way I see it eventually shaking out, um, I think cryptocurrencies are probably going to be one of the biggest industries over the next decade. And I don't believe that we're going to be confined back down to you know bitcoin or just a you know bitcoin and ethereum or something like that i think the uh the inability of people to stop you from writing your own code and running the code that you want to on your computer is going to keep this market open and free for the foreseeable future i mean, uh, I, I could go on and on and on about what go ahead Please. No, please do. Go ahead. Go on. Yeah. So tell us what you're thinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dude, I can go on and on about how, how I see it shaking out. Like, I, I yeah. want to write a book. And I've said this, like, um, go ahead. You, no, you, had, you had some a comment? You have a little bit of a lag there. No, please, oh. please do. Come on. Uh, the people want to hear from you, not from me. I want, I want to hear your predictions and everything you think. So go ahead. Well, um, we're, we're only now starting to see one of the predictions that I made on Coin Metal, the, the show that I used to do. Um, the uh, one prediction that I made on there that we're just starting to see now is the major hardware manufacturers getting into the manufacture of mining hardware. Um, that is That is probably the biggest development that I've seen over the last two years is that you know, uh, originally we had we had uh, CPU mining, 
then we went to GPU mining, and then it was, I think it was FPGA, and then and then ASICs after that. And the ASICs, um, I kind of predicted that, that we get to specialized hardware, but more importantly, that eventually the market would get big enough that companies like Intel, NVIDIA, AMD, they wouldn't be settling just for the corner market that they're getting where um, people like me or you are buying up a whole bunch of CPUs or GPUs and, and you know, building our miners with them. Um, they, they wouldn't be satisfied with, with just that segment of the market just because, the, again, the market is getting big enough that you know, when people buy up GPUs to mine with, that hurts the gaming industry. And, and it causes the, the GPUs that people want to game with to go up through the roof in price. Well, that kind of development, I believed, and I still do, would push companies like Intel and AMD into making ASICs specifically. And so when you're looking at an ASIC box now and you're, you're talking about you're going to pay 1500 to 3000 bucks for a computer that's going to do one thing and one thing only, and you're going to have a limited run where it's going to actually be competitive to use that piece of hardware for that purpose. Um, I think again, we're, we're going to see a major price drop in ASICs because the, the companies that were making ASIC chipsets, you know, like it's TSMC, but they're, they're doing a limited run. You know, they're only making a few million units, you know, per, per run. Whereas you've got Intel, and they've got big old chip fabs that are, that are that are dedicated to making chips and when it, entirely different production set you know i mean you got this this group that does this this tiny little bitty run and then you have this group that can afford to throw a lot more money at that run i i'm expecting the same thing that we saw with with home computing and and shit your cell phone I mean, if you were to compare the, the technology in your cell phone, the one that's in your pocket right now, to what was available at that same price point five years ago, you'd be carrying around a flip phone, you know, a piece of shit, POS Motorola flip phone for the same price of, of what you could pay today to have a fully functional smartphone. Well, that, that's possible because of mining. And I mean, not, not a lot of people know that, but the, the, the whole chip manufacturer industry is it's set on physical limitations like let me give you an example if you wanted to go from a 10 nanometer chip fab down to a 5 nanometer chip fab you have to do an entire retool okay you have to go to every single machine and you have to put in a different probe card to probe them you know to, to test them and whatnot you have to put in a whole different set of, of hardware to manage the difference in, in measurements on the on the circuitry that you're you're producing, right? Well, all that takes money and it takes time. You know, you're talking about four to six months of downtime for a chip fab to retool between a 10 nanometer fab to a five nanometer fab. And so when when you're looking at it from that perspective, that those are the things that that put the big constraints on your supply. You know, so if you if you were say um, Samsung, and you had this whiz bang five nanometer design for a new chipset that you're going to put in a cell phone, and it's say ten years ago, right? You, you've got a twenty six nanometer chip fab, and and to to produce a five nanometer chip, it's going to cost like five thousand dollars per unit for you to make to break even on it just because there's there's just not enough of the market that's demanding five nanometer. And plus, you've got to keep that, that chip fab operational 24-7, 365. So you have to have jobs for it. If you don't have jobs for it, it's going to sit there idle, and that's going to cost you money. And that's why you, you leave that five nanometer design on your, on your shelf in your R&D room, and it stays there for a decade until you can afford to make enough five nanometer chips to, to be able to break even at say 50 bucks, you know? And so th those are the kinds of things that, that limit chip manufacturing and, and chip development. Well, here comes Bitcoin mining, okay? And it is directly incentivized by, you plug that computer in, you tune it into the pool it's going to, bam, you are making money. 
Okay, when you when you cut that interval down between initial investment and starting to make money on break even down to you plug it in and you associate it with the mining pool. Okay. That's that's why you can look at things like I want to build a warehouse and I want to fill it with Bitcoin miners and and you know I'm, I can envision what kind of money I'm going to be making off of it. If if you can go to a boardroom with a plan like that, okay, you're that much further ahead of everybody else that's still speculating in their their R and D about you know if we make a cell phone that's got a five nanometer chip in two years we might make money on it, you know. And so again, I think that that difference in incentive has caused Bitcoin mining to be driving hardware development. You would still be looking at like a like the next CPU that you buy would probably still be like a 10 nanometer chip right now if if it weren't for Bitcoin mining. And actually it probably wouldn't even be that small. It'd probably be down to like maybe 17 nanometers just because there wasn't enough real incentive to drop the drop the size down and, and increase the efficiency in the computing power and, and access all those designs that you've got hiding the way in your R and D shelf because you don't have enough demand for it. You know, again, Bitcoin mining just brought all that stuff to the front. It said, give me your fastest computers, give me your most efficient hardware, give me your cheapest, coolest to run, whatever. And I need it now because the guy next door has already got a better chipset than I've got in my miners and he's kicking my ass. How do you, what do you think about this with, in regards to Monero and it being uh, ASIC resistant or where the CPU is, is the ASIC of Monero? Do you see it as driving the evolution of CPUs potentially? Possibly. Well, yeah, and you know, the, I don't think that the the aftermarkets are going to go away. You know, I mean, just because people are looking for the bleeding edge stuff now doesn't mean there's not going to be a period of time where it's more expensive to invest, and maybe you're not going to make your money back as quickly. Like, you know, when Bitcoin tanks down to three thousand dollars, <laughs> there's a lot of people that were looking at themselves, going, you know, it looks great to to build that that uh that hash farm at, at $10,000 a coin, but now we're looking at $3,000 a coin. And so maybe we want to delay that for about six months, you know, maybe, maybe let the market recover a little bit and, and improve our outlook for, for profit, you know, and, and during those times, people were taking the old hardware that they put away and, you know, because the hashing power would, would drop down on the network and they would, they, it would suddenly be profitable again to run that older hardware. Well, I think we're going to see the same thing again with with CPUs and GPUs, you know, especially if this whole Ukraine thing turns out the way that I think it will, where they'll get cut off from Swift, they'll get cut off from Visa and, and all the all the other digital networks. And people are going to have to use things like Monero just to buy their groceries. And if and if Monero and, and other cryptocurrencies can can work during that time. You're going to see more people mining those altcoins, and and specific, you know, that's what we saw in Venezuela. You know, they started getting busted for for mining Bitcoin with ASIC boxes and getting their ASIC boxes ganked by the cops. You know, what their their next evolution was they used to they, they took they took what they called their desktops and their gaming boxes, filled them with GPUs, and started mining altcoins with them. You know, so the 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 drive to use cryptocurrencies didn't go away. It just morphed and it kept going. And I, I think that's that's probably what we're going to be seeing in Ukraine and any other place that's challenged with, you know, we're, we don't have access to the SWIFT network anymore. What the fuck are we going to do? <laughs> you know? So what do you think about Monero's ASIC? But yeah, I, I think that ASIC resistant approach overall. Do you think it's... Um, uh, a valuable I think initiative. A market think for it. it makes sense. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think there's a market for it, and I think it it does at least one step to retain access for the average person using consumer grade hardware. And and yes, I do think that's very important. 
Cool, man. Cool. So wait, which but I, pro- I think that mining is. Go ahead, man. Which so, projects are you are you most interested in? Which cryptos are you most? Do you uh, follow the closest? The ones that you think have have actual value? Oh, I think they all do. Uh, it, it's a matter of of you. You know, I mean, what are you into using? And I think that's probably what people miss the most about cryptocurrencies is that it's not up to a government to tell you what's good. It's not up to a bank to tell you what's good. It's up to you to review the code or, or at least look at the, the project and see its track record and, and make your decisions based on what information is available to you as to what you want to use. You know, what's money to you now? But obviously, you think that the society is going to converge on on a few that they think will be most usable as money. Um, which ones do you think are are fulfilling that use case the best, or the most potential to? I I think any coin that has a functional network with with independent miners on on it, it is going to have a future. Period. And, and I and to that to that end, I don't think that we've seen the end of altcoins. I think we're going to see more new altcoins coming out, and that again is a, a a function of the market. You know, I mean, what the market wants. Um, which coins I think are good now? I think that over the next six to twelve months, provided that they actually live up to their promise of, of their use case, I think privacy coins are going to be it. You know, that Monero and Verge and other all uh, and other privacy coins, um, Zcash, uh, that they are going to be the ones that people go to because it's it's not just going to be about what, what can I use in the absence of SWIFT. It's going to be what can I use without my government stealing my money. And if your government doesn't know that you have the money, they don't know to steal your money. So yeah, privacy coins. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think people's eyes are opening to that right now. So, but h- how are people deciding between one or the other? I mean, I, I have my reasons for for Monero. I talk about it all the time on this show. I guess the largest one being that it seems to have the network effect for the purposes of of digital cash or privacy, uh, which however you want to phrase it. Um, and because of that, I think, you know, more people will begin to use it for that purpose. It will grow, will have more liquidity, but why, how, how, why choose Verge versus Monero versus Zcash? What, what, how do you think about those things? And how do you think other people are, are thinking about those things? Well, I think the viability of their market or um, their network, really, the dependability of their network, the dependability of their software, um, you know, do, what kind of support do they provide? You know, do, when you go to their their uh, Telegram channel, do you get a whole bunch of bullshit when you ask a certain uh, a, a basic question? You know, those those are really going to be the things that define it. You know, I mean, like Verge, one of the reasons I like it is that it's it's got a huge community. And it's all volunteer. You know, there's there's nobody being paid. I mean, very few people, I think, um, being paid to do anything that, that's that's for Verge. I mean, I, I did a radio show for for um, for Verge for I want to say at least four years, and uh, I, I wasn't being quote unquote paid for it. Other than I got to play whatever music I wanted, I got to talk about whatever I wanted, and sometimes I even talked about Monero. <laughs> um but the, you know the that that was the the payoff for it was was just the exposure you know and, and um just being able to do what i was doing i mean because of that i got to interview john mcafee now how many people can say that <laughs> yeah 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 um, I, although i, but, I had know, a lot of well, yeah i, I think yeah. cool man so what's um yeah I think- yeah, I, I interviewed McAfee as well. I'll have to check out yours. I'll have to check out your interview. Um, what was your initial take with Monero when you saw it launch back in the day? I, I assume you kind of saw it from the beginning. 
What was your take on Monero from mm -hmm. the early days? Um, well, you know, back then there were a lot of privacy coins. There was like shadow coin, dark coin. There were, there were a ton of different implementations of privacy features. And um, my, my take on, on Monero specifically was that I, I thought they were going in the right direction. Uh, Ricardo Spagni, i.e. Fluffy Pony, um, was all over Twitter. Um, he, was, he, was definitely, uh, he was definitely pimping his coin. Um, but we, it was a little bit different back then than it is now. Um, we're, they were certainly a lot less uh, obnoxious about, uh, about coin pimping. Um, but I, I took it as, as any other altcoin, you know, that as long as it worked, as long as it had a good community, um, as long as they had a good, a good network, that, that they would continue to function as money well into the future. And I, I still hold that perspective about Monero. It's, has your opinion of it changed in any way? No, not really. Other than I, I, I'm more impressed that they've continued as long as they have and without any kind of rebranding or anything like that. Um, the, the growth of Monero, I, I have been really impressed with it, you know, that, that it gotten over a hundred dollars. That in itself is just amazing to me. Um, but you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is people use it as money and, and that's exactly what this stuff is all, is all about, you know, is money created and curated by people, you know, average people, not a central bank, not a government, average people, volunteer miners. For people that are, you know, navigating the space, what's your advice to the, if you, if you want to give, you don't have to, but kind of what's your, your advice to them with regards to treating this stuff as an investment, right? So people are putting their money into this. They're kind of picking and choosing projects. Uh, obviously I think you're, you're kind of saying, you know, any of these projects c can potentially be successful if, if the community is there and if people are willing to use it as money. Uh, but people, you know, people that are just kind of getting into it now and looking at this space, what, how should they make these decisions? What should it be based upon? Do it. <laughs> That's it. Don't think about it. Don't, don't ask somebody's permission. Just do it. The SEC can't rule you. The CFTC can't re rule you. The FDIC doesn't, you don't owe them anything. Do it. But why, why, you know, why start using Bitcoin, throwing my money at that versus throwing it at Monero versus throwing it at something else? Like what, you know, what should be driving people? Okay. If you really want to get into that stuff, it's, you know, um, there's a PETA quotient, pain in the ass quotient, you know, how much of a pain in the ass is it for you to convert it? Um, from from something that's just software out there to something that you're using, you know, whether that's downloading a wallet, whether that's setting up a miner, whether that's setting up a lightning node and, and doing multiple on-chain transactions and paying tens of dollars, you know, hundreds of dollars for your transaction fees to set it all up. You know, the PETA quotient, <laughs> a lot of people underestimate it, but I, I see complaints on Twitter all the time about gas fees and transaction fees on Bitcoin's network and, and on Ethereum and stuff. And, and really, those, those are really big problems that they have refused to face. You know, um, Bitcoin, when they introduced the, the block size limit, they turned that block space into the most expensive real estate on planet Earth. You know, I mean, there, there was a time back in 2017, I paid $20 for a transaction fee. And it was at that point I said, this isn't going to last. This isn't going to be the way of the future, you know, as far as as far as being able to transact with anybody using Bitcoin. You know, and when I saw that they were they were pushing development to things like layer two, <laughs> I, I understood right away. These people have lost the plot. Not only have they given up on trying to fix this issue, um, but they're going about fixing it in the entire opposite direction that cryptocurrency is supposed to be going. You know, read that Bitcoin white paper, you know, peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. 
peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. The whole point was to eliminate that third intermediary between you and your intended recipient that could tell you no. And here they are trying to reintroduce new bodies in there to, to tell you no. <laughs> and I mean, we've already seen it with, with um, sanctions going on on Ukraine, where Coinbase actually has to come on Twitter and say, no, we are not going to blanket ban everybody in Russia um, because the government decided that, you know, our government decided that they want to put some imposition on, on uh, the people of Russia. We're not going to hurt average users for, for what you're trying to do to their, their government. And I, I think that uh, the, the fact that they even have to say anything like that is a demonstration of the failure of, of that, men, that like development path for Bitcoin. You know, I mean, really, if you had no other choice but to use, say, Stripe or, say, Coinbase in order to spend your Bitcoin, there's now that entity that is going to have to account for their actions in the event that they decide that, no, we're not going to let you transact with people in China using our service. You know, and again, if you if you contrast the the fact that, that, that Coinbase, Coinbase even has to say, no, we're not going to punish the average user um, versus the Bitcoin white paper, again, you understand that that use of cryptocurrencies is completely antithetical to what we're trying to do here. So do you, do you think Bitcoin will ultimately fail then because it's it's kind of being co-opted and it, it has this flaw because of its, you know, traceability or do you think it's just going to take on some some other role so it's failing as digital cash but it will provide some other use case? No, it'll either fail or succeed as digital cash. And and I think it'll do both. I don't think it'll go away. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's open source software. It's supposed to be uh, capable to change with people's abilities to use it, you know, or, or you know, to face challenges that, that it, it's being addressed with. You know, so say, say there was some sort of, uh, some sort of flaw in the algorithm that nobody saw, but the government saw, and they decided to employ it against Bitcoin and, you know, siphon a whole bunch of money out of it. In, in the event that were to happen, the developers would get together <laughs> and they would say, how is this exploit implemented and how do we get around it? But I don't think Bitcoin would go away. They would just edit the patch, put it up on the GitHub repository. People would download it as they saw fit and implement it as they saw fit. And Bitcoin would either go back into the people or it would stay with the, under that government yoke. But won't people just start start using a, a different crypto, something like Monero, for example, maybe for the digital cash use case? For for whatever period that that, that was absolutely necessary, yes. But I that if push came to shove, that Bitcoin would go back to being a, a a cryptocurrency that's processed as received and that they would get rid of the block size limit entirely. You know, I mean, this this idea that that big blocks leads to centralization, that that whole narrative was created by people that want you to use Bitcoin off chain. Because it's the only way they can justify making you do that. But I mean, we haven't seen that with BSV, <laughs> you know, um, they, and shit, uh, what's that guy? Um, basically industrial miners and, and government compliant miners and blah, blah, blah. And the idea that that, that guy is Satoshi Nakamoto just, it makes me laugh. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw kind of as a, um, not a conspiracy, but there is there is a reason why uh, the block size was limited. It didn't have to be for purposes of decentralization, but it was done more because of market forces and people that wanted to take advantage of Bitcoin and are benefiting from the fact that it has a fixed block size uh, because then it has to it has to be used in a different way. 
for example, Lightning Network yeah. or. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, when when you really think about it, okay, if if you're a um, if you're a Bitcoin user and you wanted to use Bitcoin and you you've got your Lightning node and all that business, when you, when you set up your payment channels, you're having to pay for on-chain transactions, okay. And so now imagine that the only way to use Bitcoin is via off-chain transactions. All of a sudden, the cost to establish and terminate those payment channels is going to go way up because it's not going to be just people like you who are willing to pay a buck or two or even five bucks to establish or terminate a payment channel. It's going to be Goldman Sachs. It's going to be U.S. Bank. And these people are going to be willing to pay way more than you are for that block space. And so eventually, they're going to outbid your ass from ever being able to establish or terminate your own payment channels, especially because there's only one megabyte worth of that block space every 10 minutes. So what do you think the future of Bitcoin then looks like? Is it everybody's transacting on the Lightning Network? Or like I said before, does Bitcoin fail as digital cash and some other protocol takes its place? I I think it it will hit a point where you won't have any choice but to use it via third parties and that it would either become something like SWIFT where there's only only uh, central banks that are that are mining it <laughs> um, because they're the only ones that would be using it at that point. Um, you know, of course, they would be carrying your transactions within within their payment channels and whatnot. But you, your experience of Bitcoin would be absolutely the same as using U.S. dollars via your Visa card right now. And as a matter of fact, you'd probably be using a Visa card to do your transactions with. Or, or a other ATM style card. But, but the point being that I, I think that Bitcoin itself may, may go to that fate. Um, but the other alternative would be that it, it resumes its, its use as a, uh, a publicly mined coin and that people would, would cut off the whole block size limit thing. Because from what I understand, it's only a couple lines of code. Um, but if they took out the block size limit and went back to processing transactions as received, sure, you'd have some big blocks, but you'd have some small blocks too, you know? Um, I think it though, if you really want to get down to it, though, I think that hash farms will more than likely become a military or corporate target um, before we see that happen. That... Uh, you know, because you could probably spot a hash farm from space with as much heat as they put off. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, you have to think about it in terms of like if, if it became a major tool that governments and individuals were using to circumvent government sanctions or embargoes or anything like that, it, it would suddenly become a bit of a liability to be sitting in a, a building full of full of basic miners. Because now you're now you're a military target, you know, that, and there's that whole central point of failure. It's a term that a lot of people like to forget. But go ahead, sorry. No, it's a good point. I I always try to describe that to people as well. That that potential scenario, right? So, yes, Bitcoin has a growing hash power, uh, but it's it's among uh, a. a a small group of people that basically control all, all the mining and that are easily identifiable um, and states can easily step in and knock on the doors of, of those who, who run the mining hardware uh, opposed mm-hmm. to something like Monero where, you know, it's being mined through CPUs and it's, it's a lot more difficult to round up everybody that's, that's mining Monero. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. I, that that threat has never gone away, and I think that that some people have been lulled into a little bit of complacency on that particular point, and it, it's it's something that I think we'll we'll probably see expressed on Bitcoin specifically, where you know hash farms will be targeted, 
and the, they won't have any choice but to go back to being mined in in people's dorm rooms and in, in you know some some kids mom's basement you know that the the network will have to depend on those type of nodes again instead of hash farms so do you think bitcoin then becomes co i mean from what i'm hearing you say and uh, this or maybe i'm just putting my own thoughts uh, on top of what, what you're we're saying do you see bitcoin essentially as becoming co-opted then uh, and controlled by governments uh, that they almost have the incentive for it to be adopted because it's not something that really threatens them at the end of the day as opposed to something like monero and so the bigger and stronger Bitcoin gets, the the less likely something like Monero or these other ones will succeed that uh, are, are actually more of a threat to the state. I think I think altcoins are as much a threat to the state as Bitcoin is. And I think that Bitcoin itself may go through every iteration that we've talked about so far, you know, where it would be targeted by governments that it would become limited to only uh, only corporate entities that are using it and that it would go back to average users. You know, the, the thing is, is these these aren't like discrete products like, you know, say, say this. OK, this is a grinder. OK, I can use it for a limited number of things, but it's it's a grinder. OK, Bitcoin isn't like this grinder. You know, it may appear to be the grinder at one point or another. But if something were to happen that makes its shape or its design or its capabilities a liability, then it might have to change to being an MP3 player. And the people that are participating in it are determining whether it's a grinder or an MP3 player. And this is, this is a constant conversation. It happens every 10 minutes. You know, the, the state of what Bitcoin is and the state of what Bitcoin can do is decided every 10 minutes by the miners. And if at some point the, the nature of the constituency of the miners should change, you know, it goes from being primarily corporate interest to individual users such as you and myself, that its, its shape and its function can change along with their priorities. You know, maybe they don't have the same priorities as your central bank does. And so maybe they cut out all the capabilities that they require to run shit like Lightning Network. But there, there's no there's no fixed shape or, or design or capability of Bitcoin. Hmm. Yeah, that's I, I like the way you express that. I guess just my concern is that it could be co-opted in a way where this governments can essentially determine what what form it takes on and then they determine the the fate of the technology too not allowing the people to take it back and turn it into the perhaps the form that they want it to be oh. froze Frank, you there? How seriously to take that concern? I, I, I think we can we can kind of chug. <laughs> you know, I, I want to say it's a founded concern. You know, because and and if it were something where it was it, it required government existence in order to operate, I would say you're correct. Um, but we we've never had that as a standard or 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 a limitation on what's going on in this space. And I, I think that's probably something, again, that a lot of people take for granted because it's it's so prevalent in our lives that, you know, say you're only going to put gasoline into your car. You're not going to be putting, you know, diesel fuel. You're not going to be pouring alcohol into it. You know, all of these might be flammable materials, but you're only going to be putting gasoline in it, you know, because that's it's dependent on gasoline to function properly. It, we don't have that limitation with Bitcoin or, or any other cryptocurrency for that matter. And I, I think it's it's one of the things that makes it as permissionless as it really is. Now, whether or not people resume their their level of uh, 
autonomy and independence and free will on that one as we've had before, I'm not entirely certain. I, I would like to see people take more responsibility for themselves on that point. But again, that, that's not for me to decide. That's for you to decide. I like the way you look at things, Frank. I, I like the way your, your mind works. It's, uh, it's interesting. Um, you're, you're getting me thinking in, in different ways. So in, in a purely, you know, once we move into a, a, a more, uh, a more highly, uh, adopted crypto world where more people are using crypto day to day, what, what do you see as the implications? What, what, what do you think is going to happen to society? How, how are things going to change? I know this is a big question, but have you, have you thought about that? And can you try to express that in, in any way of how you see uh, society? Absolutely. Ultimately being Absolutely. Um, crypto? Ross's Ulbricht, Ross Ulbricht's biggest crime was showing it was, was showing us what 21st century commerce could really look like. And I think that in the next, in, in the near term, we're, we're going to see more and more of the market shifting to that kind of market model, you know, where I, I say I make um, fishing lures, right? And I'm willing to accept Monero as a means of payment. Well, what else do I really need in order to make that happen other than a Monero wallet that I can send and receive payments from and an email address or a physical a way to get the physical address of my customers. Not a whole lot, maybe a website, maybe a Twitter account. And so when, when you put it in, into that kind of context, uh, I could be making anything. I could be making uh, models for, for 3D printed houses and, and be selling copies of those. I could design a house for you that, you know, we, we hook, up a, hook it up to a 3D printing gantry and we print your house on, on some Mesa in Nevada, you know. I mean, that, that's entirely possible now. There's, there's no real limitation that, that could stop that right now. And so with, with that in mind, you know, it's like I, I refer to this a lot, but the fact of the matter is, is that Bitcoin was possible in like 1970. Okay, and it was it was possible on a consumer level in like 1993. You know, but there, there's been a lot of things that have stacked on top of it. You know, I mean, like the capabilities of the Internet and so on and so forth. But, you know, technologically, it was possible back then. And so when you when you think about it in that context, you know, you, you could be doing designs for rash guards, you know, and custom designs for rash guards and selling them on eBay or, or any kind of website that you, you put out there and accept whatever cryptocurrency you want as a means of payment. I mean, you, you eliminate so much cruft just in that. I mean, like really, if you wanted to take payments in Monero, all you need is a Monero wallet. You post your, your receive address somewhere and now somebody can pay you. I mean, you know, when, when you put it into that kind of context, contrast that versus what you would need to accept payments in U.S. dollars. And all the other cruft that comes along with that. Now, now you're, you're getting tracked by SWIFT. You're getting tracked by your, your bank account. You're getting tracked by Visa, who's your carrier. You're getting tracked by the FDIC because they ensure the payments. You know, all of that stuff goes away if you decide to take payments in cryptocurrencies and now think about what kind of licensure and requirements that would take away for the retailer. You know, I mean, if I'm only accountable for the ones that I send you, what else am I accountable for? If you're willing to accept that I made the fishing lures and to my knowledge, they catch fish. I mean, what else do you care about? Do you, do you care that, you know, uh, if you don't catch fish, maybe you, you'll, You'll want your money back. Well, you know, maybe I tell you on the website if that's the if that's the expectation on your end, too fucking bad. I mean, you can't hold me to that account anymore. Um, but I, I again, 
would have to be willing to accept what what you would post on Twitter in response to me telling you to fuck off. You know, it's it's that kind of market now. And, and we had that with the Silk Road. You know, they they had a, an area where you could you could post on there, you know, dealer A gave me a bum bum trip. You know, uh, he, he actually gave me opium instead of MDMA, you know, or, <laughs> or something to that effect. But like I said, that, that was Ross Ulbricht's biggest crime was he showed us what 21st century commerce could really be. And, and I think that that altcoins such as Monero are going to continue to make that even more possible than it was back in his time. Very cool, man. Very cool. How about now we're seeing uh, essentially people being able to send money directly to dissidents or, you know, people fighting a war. Um, what's your take on that? I mean, is that something that was obvious to you as, as a potential uh, use case for crypto? Is it something that you say, you know, bring it on? Is it something that we should be uh, you know, question the the implications of, or is it all all good stuff? And it's it's un, all unstoppable anyway. So it's 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 a moot point, and society is just going to use this technology as they wish. <laughs> Power to the people. Power to the people. That's what I say to that. I mean. <laughs> you know, I don't. I don't need a Seven Eleven to do business with you if I'm using cryptocurrencies now, do I? You know, if I don't need a Seven Eleven, what other limitations have I eliminated? Power of the people. Awesome, man. Um, I wish our connection was a little better. This is a great talk. Uh, you know, maybe maybe we could do this again, Frank. Maybe you could jump on Monerotopia one of these days. I, I enjoyed the convo. Hello. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thought I lost you. Okay. Anything else? No. Good. Anything else you want to bring <laughs> up before we close it out? XBGFTW. <laughs> Either that or Monero. Use it. Do it. Power to the people. Awesome, Frank. Thanks for your time, man. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter, and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.